What's going on, fellas? I believe this is questions number 43, where you guys ask me uh, questions, things you would like my opinion on, uh, related to strength training, conditioning, strength sports. Uh, I let you know what I think. As always, if you have any questions that you would like my opinion on, uh, you can throw them into the comments of the community post that I will inevitably put up the day before I do the next one of these. Uh, I've got a reasonable number across a couple of platforms here, so we're going to work our way through them. The first one is conventional deadlift setup tips with sciatica. Um, so if we're, if we're dealing with sciatica, right, I'm not a physical therapist, I can, but I can tell you a couple of things I've seen help. Um, the biggest thing is just finding ways that are pain-free to develop the musculature surrounding the hips, so uh, especially the glutes, adductors, and hip flexors, developing that musculature um, speculating about the mechanism of action for the pain aside tends to resolve it. So doing a training cycle sumo to strengthen your glutes, your abducting musculature, uh, and then coming back to conventional can often work. I often see that doing the McGill Big 3 alongside a glute activation routine just to get a kind of holistic glute pump uh, prior to doing the deadlifts can help. And then playing around with your exercise ordering. So if you find squatting beforehand makes uh, conventional deadlifting less painful, uh, that can also be a viable strategy to kind of rehabilitate yourself without having to take a huge step away from your training. Um, as far as setup, I don't. I think that if you're dealing with sciatic issues, uh, the way you're setting up on the deadlift is not likely to be the remedy. I think you should be a little bit more robust than that and probably address that in our general physical preparedness. So the, the like holistically within our routine, what is something that we're missing potentially on a week to week training basis uh, that makes it so potentially this is painful. So that's how I would go about doing that personally, not a physical therapist, not a medical professional, very far from it, about far as far from it as you get. Uh, the next one is, do you consider overhead press to training to be essential? Absolutely not. No, I don't I don't see any reason why it would be. I mean, if we're looking to maximally develop the delts, I do think that there should be some kind of vertical press, but it doesn't necessarily need to be with a barbell. It doesn't need to be standing. Just some sort of vertical pressing motion. It could even be a high incline motion. I find quite helpful for maximally developing your deltoids. Kind of checks off that front head of the delt. Um, and then as far as strength training goes, even if you're a power lifter and you're focused on your bench, I find that having a vertical press in your routine is helpful for keeping the shoulders healthy but again it doesn't have to be uh, crazy heavy you don't need to get crazy strong on it um, but it just needs to be checked each week it doesn't need to be a barbell so uh, also what grip do you recommend for deadlifts uh, that's goal dependent if your goal training goals are more bodybuilding related I see no reason not to wear straps if you're going to be deadlifting uh, if you're goals are general training. Uh, again, I would probably lean towards straps. If you would like to test your grip strength within the deadlift, uh, double overhand and mixed grip both have their place. Um, and then from a competitive powerlifting standpoint, you kind of have the option of trial and erroring between hook grip and mixed grip and finding which you find better suited. If you find that the benefits of a double overhand grip outweigh the negatives of kind of dealing with some pain and potentially some inconsistency that comes with hook grip, uh, then hook grip is probably for you. If, the, if that double overhand position makes your start position that much more efficient, if you don't find it makes a huge difference, maybe going with the more consistent grip. I think people worry a little bit too much um, about bicep tears. I think if you're really diligent about flexing your tricep, on the other hand, the risk remains pretty low. I mean, obviously there's an injury risk anytime we do anything, right? It's like squatting to depth has a probably increased risk of a quad tear, but we still do it and say, okay, well, if we adequately prepare most of the time, we're gonna be fine. Though there are always kind of freak accidents. Um, recommended rep ranges slash intensities for overhead press. Uh, anywhere above probably about 55 to 60% all the way to 100% are valuable working weights and anywhere probably from 12 down to one reps. Uh, you know, anytime we're trying to maximally develop a lift, especially if it's a lift that we're interested in both for hypertrophy and for maximal strength, we're going to be wanting to train a variety of rep ranges across the training cycle, maybe starting in the higher rep ranges, working our way down and eventually ending with some singles. So uh, I would recommend all of them and above 60%. Um, the last one on this Instagram thing is uh, home gym must haves. That depends on um, your space, right? I think that if we save up for long enough, we can afford most of the things eventually, right? So we're not looking at this from a money perspective necessarily, but we're looking at it from a space perspective. So we check the basics, right? We get a power rack, we get whatever bars, bar or bars we like, we get some weights, uh, we get an adjustable bench. 
Assuming the rack has a pull-up bar, we have opened up a ton of options. We have uh, enough space to do some deadlifts, put the mats down on the floor. We have a lot of options there. So where do we go from there, assuming we have the space, I think is the question. Um, Max and I have been debating this a lot. We're kind of back and forth on a couple of pieces as to uh, what is uh, the most important, right? Because what I just said, that's the essentials ultimately. Uh, past that are mostly niceties, but what's the order of the niceties in which I would buy them? I would probably then go buy a lat pull down low row combo if you're trying to save some money, uh, def and space. I would get a plate loaded one. If you got a big space, you want to ball out, getting a stack loaded one. Um, I think that would be my next option. Then I would probably look to a glute ham raise. Um, yeah, so a GHD uh, glute ham developer, right? Uh, I think would be my next choice. And then now we're really getting into like the we're balling out. We really want a home gym. I want to sacrifice nothing while I'm training at home. And I would say there's kind of three or four things that are really nice to have that like realistically most people don't have the space for. Uh, one would be a cable machine, very expensive, but opens up a ton of options. Uh, two would be some sort of uh, squat pattern motion that isn't limited by your back. So this could be a hack squat, uh, this could be a leg press, or this could be a belt squat. Uh, there are more and more affordable belt squat options such as the one by like Bells of Steel, I think the Texas strength system one's not that crazy. Titan offers one. Um, leg presses are a little bit up and then hack squats a little bit even more expensive than that to get one that's sturdy. But having that in your training is quite nice. Um, and like, like I said, we're kind of in like the dream options here, but uh, the other two that I would love, right, if we're building an ideal gym, trying to still do these in order, would probably be some kind of chest supported row or chest supported row station uh, to do so with a barbell, one or the other like a plate loaded chest support row or chest support T-bar row. And then finally would be like a leg extension ham curl combo piece as the least important of all of the things I've said. Um, I think that you could make a good argument for the chest support row increasing in priority. Um, and most people would not necessarily have space for the belt squat. Uh, but I think that if we're really bowling out and we're trying to make it as optimal as we can in a home gym setting, uh, it's, it's definitely an important exercise slot. So I got one more on Instagram that someone DM'd to me that I thought was a pretty interesting one. He asks, uh, how to get friends into lifting? Obviously it's better for them to take the initiative and do it themselves, but should I push them to get involved or just lead by example and hope they follow suit? This is a great question. Um, I am not the wisest man in the world. All I can tell you is uh, my own sheltered life, what I have observed, and I would tell you, uh, that there is very few things more frustrating than being more invested in someone else's results than they are. It's a very frustrating process. Uh, so I got to the point where I really wouldn't invite someone to the gym, right? I would make it so that they know they always have the option of coming with you, uh, knowing that you're willing to show them the ropes if they want to, but not trying to get them to, uh, because ultimately, Nine times out of 10, that's not gonna to lead to someone who's like a lifelong gym goer. They're gonna burn out in a couple of months and it's just gonna be kind of annoying for you to have a training partner briefly uh, that stops showing up after a little bit. Um, just the chance that that happens is so large. Generally speaking, I would invite people. What I would do is just kick ass, be a stud, eat your meals, drink your water, uh, train hard. People will see you getting jacked and strong and those who are interested will ask you as long as you, you kind of present yourself in a friendly way. You make sure they know you're open to it. I think other people will be inspired. So exactly like you said, I, I did appreciate that you kind of had a good answer built into the question, which is that you probably should just lead by example. I think that uh, especially if you you know reach a good level of motivation and drive and discipline, uh, people will see that and it is something that's rare and they will be inspired by it. Uh, you know, it's like whatever walk of life you're in, it's pretty rare to see someone who's really going out of their way and choosing to do more work than uh, their life makes them. And I think that people will probably respect that and the ones that will stick with it will ask about going with you and the ones who wouldn't stick with it to begin with probably will not ask. Um, and then we are going to get into the couple that I got on YouTube and that will be it for the day. So the first one is for someone who has a close grip bench, do you think a wider grip bench could be a good variation? Uh, keep it up, Sam, close to road to 1K. You're damn right road to 1K. That's why we're not missing any videos, hopefully, for the next 
uh, however long it takes to get to 1K. One a day is the goal. Hold me to it. Um, yeah, absolutely, right? Um, just like how someone with a wider grip uh, might hit something with a closer grip as a variation to kind of pick up the musculature uh, that they're missing in their competition style press. So maybe they're underdeveloping the triceps a little bit with a very wide grip on the bench press. Uh, we can kind of pick up what's missed with our accessories and do something with a close grip, kind of bolster our overall development raise our base strength and then capitalize on that further. I think very much the same thing could be said about a close grip bencher, right? We're kind of favoring away from the pecs, um, potentially masking some weakness in the pecs if you're someone who benches more or as much as they do from a pretty standard grip with a very close grip, there's a good chance the reason for that is your pecs are a little bit underdeveloped. So taking an exercise slot to take a little bit wider grip uh, can be very beneficial for bringing up the musculature that you're kind of avoiding with your main motion. Um, that being said, it is something that I would be very careful with because I find that for most people, uh, jumping right into a wide grip bench press uh, that they are not used to is much more dangerous than jumping into a close grip bench press that they are not used to. So keeping the reps, uh, I'd probably say four and up, keeping a good controlled negative, maybe even higher than four to start out, um, picking the variations well, maybe even doing a wider grip bench press on the Smith machine, doing a dumbbell bench with your elbows flared a little bit more. This can look a lot of different ways. And then one other option kind of akin to the Smith machine is to do a uh, hammer strength chest press kind of abducting the arms, letting the elbows flare, learning to stretch the pecs, load them, pause, go. Uh, that can also be a very good accessory for someone whose competition uh, technique or their primary technique doesn't necessarily tax the pecs as much as it possibly could. Um, the next one is how fast do you up the intensity when peaking for a max? Uh, and do you keep it easy slash low RPE for the most part? Well, so heavy singles is a skill, so it can't be that low of an RPE. It's also just impossible to hit, like let's say 95% for that low of an RPE. Most people can hit about 95% for a double, so at best you're gonna do a single at nine, which I wouldn't consider a low RPE. Um, I, would I would tell you that the biggest thing that says like how fast do we up the intensity while peaking is what part of the training cycle do you define as peaking? Is that everything above 85%? Is that everything above 90%? Uh, it, it just depends on how we're defining the peaking phase versus what is the heavier end of a strength phase. Um, so what I would tell you is if we're just going to say it's 90% and above, uh, I like to only spend three weeks above 90% for most people. That's, this can vary greatly, uh, but usually one week where we're touching about 90%, one week where we're touching 94, 95%, uh, and then we do a small deload, and then we would hit a 101%, hopefully. Um, most often than not, I don't find a ton of utility in spending many consecutive weeks above 90%, though other people do. Um, I would say, especially for people who aren't technically proficient and don't have a large existing hypertrophy base, that might not be the best use of your time spending many, many consecutive weeks above 90%. But that's a really open-ended question. It kind of just depends on your training methodology. Uh, how long you spend above 90% is also very, very dependent on what you did before we got to that 90%? Did we spend six months laying down uh, like a hypertrophic base that we really need to work on our ability to capitalize on? Maybe it'll be a bit, uh, be a bit longer, spend a little bit longer above 90%. Um, or are we just doing, uh, did we only train for like four weeks prior to that? And uh, realistically, we haven't laid down very much um, baseline strength that we need to capitalize on, right? So it's going to be dependent on that. Uh, the next question, I like this one quite a bit, by the way. Uh, in a four day upper lower uh, squat day, overhead day, deadlift day, bench day, would you train the accessories relative to each lift on the day dedicated to that lift or perform those accessories during the other session for the body part? Uh, example, deadlifts followed by posterior chain work and hamstring isolation versus doing those accessories on squat day and then doing the quad focused work after deadlift day um, to double the frequency at which you're training the primary movers. Uh, sorry for the long question. Didn't know how to summarize it further. Great question. I would say it's an adequate level of detail. I think everybody understands what you're saying is if we have two days, we have one squat day, one deadlift day, do we throw our deadlift accessories after the squat and our squat accessories after the deadlift? Uh, that way we're kind of spreading the fatigue more evenly across the week and stimulating each of those muscles twice per week rather than once per week? And I would tell you, yes, I think this is a very good idea. This is something that I do within my own training. Um, I'm a general believer in the idea that 
most people, when we're talking about a strength training context, are going to respond better. Let's say we have uh, 80 stimulus points across the week. Instead of on Monday training to hell and back and using all of our 80 stimulant, stimulus points on one day, uh, people will get much better results spreading that evenly across four days of 20. For example, right, just picking random numbers, if we think of the amount of fatigue we're incurring, spreading that more evenly across the week, generally speaking, we're stimulating the muscle more often, we're having more potential for hypertrophy, right? Let's say most hypertrophy happens within 48 hours of a workout. Uh, if we're doing squat and then quad accessories, we only have a growth window of 48 hours per week. Uh, whereas if we do the squat accessories after deadlifts, we have that 48 hour window twice every week. So potentially we would get more hypertrophy out of the same amount of total work. So from a hypertrophy perspective, that's great. Uh, if we're avoiding burying ourselves in any one session in local or global fatigue, our performance for subsequent sessions is also going to be better, which from a strength perspective, hypertrophy aside, I think also tends to be a lot better. So I would tell you that this is something I would really recommend trying. I think the old school squat and then crush legs and then, you know, deadlift and posterior chain or overhead press then tr crush shoulders. I think the same thing could be said for the upper session. Maybe we hit heavy overhead and then our bench accessories, and then maybe we hit heavy bench and then our overhead accessories. I find that training the musculature uh, more often and simply doing the same amount of volume but hitting a 2x frequency by doing this uh, will yield better results for the majority of people. Big fan of this, great question, thank you for asking. Um, the next one is how to program GPP work uh, to be fitter, increase work capacity, and build some muscle. Um, so I'm gonna be honest with you, if you're following a reasonably difficult training routine, um, all you're going to need to do to, do to achieve your goals is not add in any GPP and hold yourself to a more aggressive pace, especially for your accessories. I don't know you in particular, but I will tell you that 95% of the people I've ever seen train uh, just hold themselves to a pathetically slow pace through their accessories and justifying it saying it's maximizing their performance, but really it doesn't make that big of a difference. If you get in shape, you push your pace, you kind of get in better shape, you're able to perform better with less rest. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds uh, by pushing the pace potentially our uh, hypertrophy outcome could be better depending on how much we buy into the fact that work density might have something to do with hypertrophy, you know, the pacing of the workout. Um, I think a lot of people would push back on that and that's A-OK. -okay. Uh, but from our work capacity, we'll go up greatly from pushing a greater work density um, and we're just gonna be fitter in general, right? So I think a lot of the time, if someone just wants to be in good shape, that can be achieved with a training they're already doing. Um, just maybe supersetting some of the antagonistic work you do during the day uh, you know, it's like while you would be resting for your deadlift, realistically, if you did a set of abs that you're going to do that day uh, between each set, it's not going to drastically decrease your performance because we're not training any of the same primary movers. Um, and we could just fit in a lot greater work per minute, we'd be in a lot better shape. Uh, if that is not enough and you want to be in better shape than that, doing dedicated conditioning hit sprints, uh, either to warm up, to end, or uh, the one I really like advocating is to do some sort of conditioning every rest day. I'm a big advocate for the idea that you should exercise in some capacity every day. Um, obviously, we can't train heavy every day. That's not a sustainable model. And it doesn't account for the fact that rest is part of the adaptation process, right? But we can train different qualities on our rest days and potentially get a better restorative effect by doing active rest rather than passive rest. Uh, depending on what you like, you could do a steady state cardio on your rest day, you could do a hit cardio, you could do something more of an athletic workout on your rest day where we're not really touching weights. There's a lot of options we could do to get in better shape just by uh, challenging our physicality a little bit on our rest days. Um, just as much as I think it's a physical thing, I think that the idea of exercising every day being a mandatory is a, is a very good mental thing, both for mental health and for general mental toughness. Um, yeah, so I'd say that's a big thing. Push your workout dense, like work density. Uh, maybe do some conditioning during your day. Definitely do some conditioning on your off days. Um, and then, you know, we could have a lot of fun with something like sled push workouts. You know, we could do uh, a myriad of supersets. There's lots of different ways you can have fun with pushing your conditioning as well, uh, whether it be loaded carries for really far distances. But the biggest thing is just finding ways to build it into your training that doesn't take more time, it takes less time. 
And then the final question for the day is, if your dog was able to deadlift, do you think he would deadlift more than you and Max? So this is a very complex question because Ode has the longest legs I've ever seen on anything other than a Great Dane. Very weirdly long. I don't know what he's a, he's a mix of because he's a Dutch Shepherd and some other stuff. One of them must have really long legs. So he's got great leverages, probably lock out below his kneecaps. But he is also extremely, extremely wildly weak for a big 120 pound scary looking dog. Uh, he is so weak it is laughable and I'm not sure what to do about it. I might start making him pull a sled or something, uh, do some ethical dog exercise, give him some treats after he pulls some sleds and progressively overload him or something. Weirdly weak. Probably going to have him do some kind of exercise at some point. Uh, loses tug of war to little, little dogs. But very handsome guy. I'm sure if he put his mind to it, you know, he's got the long limbs, he could deadlift a lot. But as of right now, no, I don't think he's out pulling me and Max. Uh, thank you guys for asking the questions. As always, I appreciate your participation in the channel. Road to 1K, baby. What's up, bubs? Oh. 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 Good boy.